the unsurpassed, penetrating, and perfect truth is seldom met with, even in a hundred thousand myriad countless. Now we can see and hear it. We can remember and accept it. I vow to make the Buddha's truth one with myself. Homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha. <clears throat> the title for our talk today is The Coronavirus. This is not a war, this is a marathon. So I'd like to start out with a few words of the Buddha on how to train with the issues of our time. Towards all beings, maintain unbiased thoughts and speak unbiased words. Towards all beings, give birth to thoughts and words of kindness instead of anger, compassion instead of harm, joy instead of jealousy, <coughs> excuse me, equanimity instead of prejudice, prejudice, humility instead of arrogance, sincerity instead of deceit, compromise instead of stubbornness, <coughs> assistance instead of avoidance, liberation instead of obstruction, kinship instead of animosity. These are the words of the Buddha. I'd also like to offer merit to all those in the hospital, to all those who would like to get into the hospital and can't, to all the healthcare professions, the firefighters, those in quarantine or sheltering, those who are in the unemployment lines or in the unemployment office, our government officials, those in prison, grocery stores, truckers, protesters, immigration, the postal system, our government officials, all of those who have died from COVID-19, and those who have survived. The homeless, the jobless, the maskless, and everyone in between. I offer merit to all things. Excuse me, for get this straightened out. That's better. There is an overabundance of information available to us. There's also an overabundance of merit available to us to help us, as the, to help us with the choices we make to deal with our daily lives during the coronavirus pandemic. For me, it's good to remember it's not what I think. It's staggering to acknowledge and accept what has unfolded this year especially in the face of what we are collectively and individually experiencing, is, is a result of our own actions. We chose not to continue the preparations for the pandemic, even though we knew it was coming. It's clear the law of the universe is still fully intact. That's the laws of the universe. <clears throat> It seems that the coronavirus story in the beginning, generally, at least for me, was spoken, of, was spoken of and described with words I associate with war, such as COVID-19 is an act of external aggression, an assault by an invisible enemy, one of a passive population suddenly attacked by a foreign being, an act of terrorism, or an alien invasion. In accordance with those metaphors, at times, our response has been framed as a form of combat, how to handle an invasive intruder. Borders have been closed, flights grounded, cruise ships full of sick passengers waved away. The scale of the response has been unprecedented. Yes, we have been here before. The ideas are from an old and familiar way of thinking. A paradigm, I think it's called. It is time for us to consider human health in the context of the health of wildlife, livestock, and ecosystems. Let me say that again because I think it's really important. It is time for us to consider human health 
in the context of health of wildlife and the health of livestock and the health of ecosystems. Now is the time to change how we think and respond in harmony together, locally and globally. It took over a decade to develop effective therapies, therapies for AIDS, and to this day, as far as I know, there is no effective HIV vaccine. Drugs and vaccines for a wide range of other newly emerged pathogens, from West Nile virus to Ebola and to MRSA, have proven similarly elusive. In 1976, Ebola emerged from the Congo forest. As swiftly as it came, it disappeared, leaving no trace. Over the four decades since, Ebola has emerged sporadically, each time to a devastating effect. Now this is 2020. Who knows what will happen? We'll see. When microbes cause harm, the problem often stems from the way our antibodies respond to the microbes, not the microbes' actions themselves. In April of 1994, in an article for Outside Magazine, Natural Acts, David Quayman writes, A virus can't run, no legs. A virus can't fly, no wings. A virus on its lonesome is roughly as immobile as a capsule of Tylenol, as a nugget of rock salt, or a bullet in the absence of a gun. Yes, it's alive, but you'd never guess. Lacking outside assistance, excuse me, yeah, lacking outside assistance, a virus just sits there, lump-like, doing nothing. As a cellular parasite, it can't reproduce itself except with the help of a host cell. And it can't move except as a moat, a drift in the air, or as a stowaway inside some other living creature. In a manner of speaking, a virus is incapable of travel. But don't be misled. These things go everywhere. We live in an age of fleet and horrific viral traffic. So this was written almost 25 years ago, which is hard to put in 25 years. Okay, yeah, that's right. And among others, Mr. Quagman pretty much predicted the coronavirus pandemic in 2012, as many other scientists have tried to help us with this. The majority of pathogens that have emerged since 1940 originated in the bodies of animals and entered human populations, not because they invaded us, but because we invaded their habitats. This is not a war, nor is it a sprint. This is a marathon, a marathon with no beginning or no end, with impermanence cheering us along the way. As of August 19th, 2020, there was almost 800,000 deaths and 22 and a half million confirmed cases of coronavirus globally. Behind those statistics is a great deal of pain and suffering. For me, it's uncertain what those numbers mean. And once I acknowledge the grief, Change is what I feel. Each moment, the water of a river is flowing and is different, so it is constantly <laughs> changing. <coughs> but there is still a certain continuity to the river as a whole. Turning, twisting, ebbing, flowing to the sea. We're just, <clears throat> we're just the same as this river. Turning, twisting, stillness, 
flowing. Just let it all be. Everything is impermanent and without independent existence. We recognize that there is a need to be responsible for what we do within this continuity. Even though it's optional, we suffer. We, we create suffering for ourselves when we do not recognize the reality of impermanence and this lack of independent existence. We grasp at things we like and try to push away things we don't like. We create an unending cycle of our attempt to protect our egos. Sometimes we're in heaven, sometimes we're in hell. Our lives go up and down and up. We fall down, we get up, we grabs it, we let go. We fall down, we get up. Lucky for us, we are meditators and we have heard and are practicing the Buddhist teachings. <clears throat> and we get up one more time than we fall down. Even a marathon is run one step at a time. We train for the sake of training, one step at a time, and do our best to stay in the present moment. <clears throat> From my experience over the last couple of years, I have been given a better understanding of what it means to be in a hospital, sick, and really not wanting to be in a hospital. It's my good karma that Venerable Master Daishin was with me the entire stays in the hospital, storing away in planes and ambulances, sleeping in chairs, walking the streets of Portland in order to retrieve food, any food, something that I might actually eat, doing laundry, and talking to all the doctors, nurses, monks, and friends. He was there. Even when I had a meltdown, he was bright and even-minded, holding out to me an indefatigable example of, excuse me, <clears throat> of ceaseless practice and faith. As much as I wanted to get out of the hospital, and I did, I was blown away to be receiving such attentive care and a steady flow of acts of kindness and compassion, not only from Venerable Master Daishin, but a very long list of doctors, nurses, phlebotomists, MRI technicians, and the Sangha, just to name a few. I got a clear picture on a couple of occasions how everyone was doing their best to help me so I could recover and get home to Zadie to really start healing. Regardless of their compassion, or the years of schooling, they did not know what was wrong with me at times or what to do next. Being human applies to them. It applies to me. It applies to all of us. Being kind and non-judgmental helps self and others beyond measure. Being bright and even-minded keeps us still. I think the Dalai Lama said this, in one sense we can say that other sentient beings are really the principal source of all our, of all our experiences of joy, happiness, and prosperity. We can see that all the desirable experiences that we cherish or aspire to attain are dependent upon cooperation and interaction with other sentient beings. I think that the moment you develop a sense of caring, others appear more positive. And he says that that's because your attitude changes. So um, I really like that it's kind of up to us. So all things are one and different at the same time. Two things that appear contradictory when viewed from the heart of meditation are not. I learned that when something happened and the self left the room, something was meditating still, very brightly. 
The experience of no longer being attached to a personal self reveals how existence, how our thoughts, everything and anything is inextricably bound to the unborn, the uncreated, and the undying. It was here I discovered the heart of the crux move for myself. And it is best said, you know, I've seen it in the Lotus Sutra and many times in the Shoba Genzo, but it, it goes something like this, that only a Buddha, together with Buddha, realizes the reality of existence. Back in 1978, Ramasterji gave a talk titled The Art of Meditation. And here's a few words that she said. It's, I believe the talk is on our website. It's really well worth listening to if you have a moment. <clears throat> meditation is neither an art or a science. If there is an art about it at all, it is discovering what its purpose is, which also means what your purpose is. So let me repeat that. If there is an art about it at all, and she's talking about meditation, it is discovering what, it, what its purpose is, which also means what your purpose is. After the Buddha's enlightenment in the Udana scripture, he states, O oh monks, now I know there is an unborn, undying, uncreated. If there was not an unborn, undying, uncreated, I would not have found enlightenment. Ramaster Jiu continues, You should know anyone who meditates runs the risk of being grabbed by the cosmic Buddha. The purpose of meditation, which is in effect an extraordinarily deep spiritual prayer prayerful experience, is to become one with the cosmic Buddha, or if you like, to have an experience of God, to know his existence, to know that he exists, and to become one with it. This is the purpose of meditation. The art of getting there is another matter. She also says, what is necessary is a heart full of love, a strong desire to be united, united again with that which is truly one with you, with that which you were, excuse me, and that which you were before you were born, and that which you know before your educators, your parents, and your teachers told you you were a dreamer, useless, and to become normal like everyone else. You come to meditate not completely happy with yourselves personally. Most people come to meditation for a reason that they won't even admit to, she says, fear of life and fear of death. There's something right here about this birth and death, this living and dying. I've been stumbling around for a few weeks uh, over the letters and the words trying to put it into words uh, and I haven't come up with anything that seems to make too much sense. But the Shoshogi has a lovely first paragraph that leads us in many directions here and it says, as many of you are familiar with, the, more, the most important question for all Buddhists is how to understand birth and death completely. Should you be able to find the Buddha within birth and death, they both vanish. All you have to do is realize that birth and death as such should not be avoided and they will cease to exist. For if you can understand that birth and death are nirvana itself, there is no there is not excuse me there is not only no necessity to avoid them but also nothing to search for that is called nirvana the understanding of this breaks the chains that bind one to birth and death therefore this problem which is the greatest of all buddhism must be completely understood So the only thing I could come up with that made half sense is, um, this is, it just is, and it seems appropriate for each of us to explore and experience for ourselves what this, you know, what this is pointing us to. 
And for me, when I don't understand death, life is very confusing. And I guess what I'm actually trying to say, not very well, is that it's not an experience. It's, um, I know, the best way I can say it is, you know, step outside. Hear the bird sing and then let it go. Observe your inner self. Listen. If you know nature, you know the Dharmakaya. And if you know the Dharmakaya, you know nature. So Great Master Dogen says, so do not be upset over what is not and do not be pressured by what is. I love that. Learning how to meditate and committing your life to a consistent practice may be the most important essential decision you have ever made. I know it is true for me. The merit from ceaseless practice sustains us and sustain other. We concentrate our effort. We show up each and every day. There is no forcing, forcing oneself, or being forced to do it. We are spiritually nourished to do it. We are spiritually nourished through ceaseless practice, which has no beginning and no end. We are lavished with loving kindness. We recognize the impermanence of all thoughts and things, and we dedicate ourselves to expressing compassion to all beings. With every step, turn towards the Buddha. Whether you are dying or brightly alive, keep your heart open and take a wide view. Just keep going. Remember Master G who says, I think it's in an article of how to find Kanzion in hell, if I remember right. The deeper we go into meditation, the more suffering becomes apparent. And the more apparent it is, our faith shall deepen and that we learn to recognize the little golden moments that point the way to the cosmic Buddha. So in closing, I'd like to read something that was written by a Chinese Zen master, I'm not sure how to say this, but it's Chosa Kenshin, who lived from 788 to 868, while he was addressing his assembly during a Dharma talk. And here's what he had to say. <clears throat> the whole universe in all ten directions is a mendicant monk's eye. The whole universe in all ten directions is a mendicant monk's everyday speech. The whole universe in all ten directions is a mendicant monk's whole body. The whole universe in all ten directions is the brightness of one's own being. The whole universe in all ten directions reside within the brightness of one's own being, <clears throat> the brightness of one, one's own being. In the whole universe, in all the ten directions, there is not even one person who is not his or her own being. So what is this brightness? To me, it speaks to about our relationships, our connections, and about our daily life. Brightness. Nothing is outside this brightness. Things we may usually see are not this brightness, and this brightness is not separate from those things we see and experience in day-to-day -day life. Be well, my friends. Be safe and be fluid. And Buddha bows to Buddha.